Hello and welcome to the Following Truth Bible Study. I'm your host LJ. In this video we're going to be looking at 1 John 5 7 and which is the correct reading. Is it the longer reading as it is found in the KJV? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Or the shorter reading as it is found in most modern Bibles as uh, such as the NIV. For there are three that testify. Now this reading can also be found in the ESV and the NASB. And a reading very similar to this is found in most modern versions. What I won't be doing in this study is making an argument for the verses appeal to the Trinity. I have addressed that in uh, another video. I shall only be dealing with is the wording as found in the KGV correct? I will also point out that this is the only verse, although I believe is scripture, that I would not use in a debate if someone rejected it. As I do believe that if we are going to engage in honest scholarly work, we must accept that there is much evidence against this verse being scripture, but probably not as much as is commonly believed. And I think that there uh, is much evidence for the inclusion as scripture, as I'm obviously going to try to show in this video. Now, it is a common belief today, including held by most scholars, that the words of the verse, as they appear in the KJV, do not belong in scripture. It is often stated that they are not included in the majority of Greek manuscripts available to us today, and were actually a later edition of Erasmus in his third edition of his Greek New Testament, which later became uh, known as the Textus Receptus. These two points are often used when attacking the KJV only standpoint. In this study, I will address both of these points and look at the arguments against uh, the reading as it is found in the KJV. So let's start with Erasmus. Firstly, when it comes to the claim that Erasmus added these words, there are actually two myths regarding the claim uh, that he added the words in his third edition and didn't include them in his first two. The first and most popular being that Erasmus, after excluding the wording as found in the longer reading in his first edition, had promised that he would include the comma Johannium in his future editions if a single Greek manuscript was found that contained it. This manuscript, commonly believed to be Codex Montefortianius, was either found or was simply made to order. This myth was propagated by Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger wrote, Erasmus promised that he would insert the comma Johannium, as it is called, in future editions if a single Greek manuscript could be found that contained the passage. At length, such a copy was found or made to order. Metzger, the text of the New Testament, first and second editions. Now, the second and more recent myth being that Erasmus had challenged Edward Lee to find a Greek manuscript that included the Comma Johannium. This myth was started with Erica Rommel in 1986 in a book, Erasmus Annotations. It would later be repeated by Dr. James White in his book, The Truth About the KJV Only Controversy in 1995. Now it is the latter who has likely made more of an impact with this claim. However, both of these myths have been refuted by H.J. Dion, the Dean of the Faculty of Theology in the Netherlands. In 1980, Dion, a recognized expert on Erasmanian studies, stated regarding Metzger's assertion regarding a promise that it, and I quote, has no foundation in Erasmus' work. Consequently, it is highly improbable that he included the difficult passage because he considered himself bound by any such promise. 
Subsequently, Metzger retracted his own assertion in his own third edition of the text of the New Testament, and I quote, What is said on page 101 above about Erasmus' promise to include the Comma Johannium, if one Greek manuscript were found that contained it, and his subsequent suspicion that manuscript 61 was written expressly to force him to do so, needs to be corrected in the light of the research of H.J. Dion, a specialist in Erasmian studies who finds no explicit evidence that supports this frequently made assertion. Metzger, the text of the New Testament, 3rd edition, page 291, footnote 2. Now, Metzger did write this in a footnote, but uh, it is there as a retraction. However, this myth is still alluded to today, obviously by those who have, through lack of a full study on the subject, only read or are aware of the assertion of Metzger and not the later retraction of his claim. De Jong also refuted the claim of a challenge. De Jong wrote in a letter dated June 13th, 1995, to Michael Maynard. I have checked again Erasmus' words quoted by Erica Rommel and her comments on them in her book Erasmus Annotations. This is what Erasmus writes on in his Liber Tertius Quo Responde. Erasmus first records that Lee had reproached him with neglect of the manuscripts of 1 John because Erasmus, according to Lee, had consulted only one manuscript. Erasmus replies that he had certainly not used only one manuscript, but many copies, first in England, then in Brabant, and finally in Basel. He cannot except, therefore, Lee's reproach of negligence and impiety. Is it negligence and impiety if I did not consult manuscripts which were simply not within my reach? I have at least assembled whatever I could assemble. Let Lee produce a, man a Greek manuscript which contains what my edition does not contain, and let him show that that manuscript was within my reach. Only then can he reproach me with negligence in sacred matters. From this passage you can see that Erasmus does not challenge Lee to produce a manuscript. What Erasmus argues is that Lee may only reproach Erasmus with negligence of manuscripts if he demonstrates that Erasmus could have consulted any manuscript in which the comma Johannian figured. Erasmus does not at all ask for a manuscript containing the comma Johannium. He denies Lee the right to call him negligent and impious. If the latter does not prove that Erasmus neglected a manuscript to which he had access. In short, Rummel's interpretation is simply wrong. The passage she quotes has nothing to do with the challenge. Also, she cuts the quotation short so that the real sense of the passage becomes unrecognizable. She is absolutely not justified in speaking of a challenge in this case or in the case of any other passage on the subject. Emphasis in original. De Jong cited from Maynard, page 383. Geoffrey Koo also wrote, Yale professor Roland Bington, another Erasmian expert, agrees with De Jong, furnishing proof from Erasmus's own writing that Erasmus' inclusion of 1 John 5, 7 was not due to a so-called promise but the fact that he believed the verse was in the Vulgate and must therefore have been in the Greek text used by Jerome. Geoffrey Koo kept pure in all ages, 
2001, page 88. So we see both myths do not hold up under scrutiny. Erasmus simply stated that he would have included the longer verse if any manuscript did include it. But as already shown, this in no way constitutes a promise, nor did he make a bet regarding the inclusion, as some claim. Erasmus only didn't include the verse because the manuscripts that he had at the time of writing his uh, version didn't include them. We know Erasmus worked off of limited manuscripts in his early works. This did not mean that they did not exist. It just means that he did not have access to them at the time of his writing. Now, Erasmus included the words in his later editions. He did not add them. There is a fundamental difference between these two words. The words were already well known and attested to, as we will shortly see. Erasmus believed that the words were part of scripture, and so he eventually added them. Let's have a look at the majority manuscripts. Now, it is very true that the majority of Greek manuscripts that we have available today do not include the words as they are found in the KJV. Now, while at first this might sound overwhelming, as we have over 5,700 or so manuscripts available today, we must be aware that there are around 480 that contain 1 John 5. And between, uh, between the 2nd and the 7th century, there are only five manuscripts that contain 1 John 5, 7. So we have a much less uh, witness in the early part of uh, our manuscript evidence. Also worthy of note is that there are no papyrus in existence that contain this verse. In total, there are only 12 manuscripts that contain 1 John 5, 7 before the 10th century. And I've listed them all here. The oldest manuscript that we have that includes this section of 1 John 5, 7 is Codex Vaticanus. Codex Vaticanus does not contain the verse as it is found in the KJV. However, this manuscript comes to us around 200 years after John uh, had written 1 John. Uh, and if anyone has ever read any of my writings regarding this manuscript, they will know that uh, I argue that this manuscript, like other manuscripts of the Alexandrian origin, are corrupt. Now, I'm not going to go into that in this video, in this study um, that is available in my other studies. Now, it is also worth noting, since it is most often not stated, that even though Codex Vaticanus does not include the verse as found in the KJV, it does have an amulet, a double dot at this point of 1 John 5 7. Now, Amulets indicate that there is a textual variant known by the scribe. And you can see here the amulet. The manuscripts that include the words are from uh, 629 from the 14th century, 61 from the 16th century, 918 from the 16th century, 2473 from the 17th century, and 23. 1, 8 from the 18th century. Those that argue against the KJV using this fact, but use versions of the Bible other than the KJV, are rather shooting themselves in the foot. While the majority text uh, is obviously important and cannot simply be ignored, if the only thing that confirms the authenticity of a scripture is the majority reading, then the text that underlines the vast majority of the modern versions, such as the NIV, ESV, NASB, ERV, ISV, NALT, and, and uh, NET and such, face the same problem themselves, as 
they depart away from the majority text reading in literally thousands of places. I wonder how many of those who, that reject this verse also stay consistent and reject all of the other minority readings that are found in their modern Bibles. This would leave them unable to use their modern uh, versions in literally thousands of places. The men behind the text, uh, behind the modern versions, Westcott and Hort, themselves proclaimed that the true reading may be found in the minority reading. A few documents are not, by reason of their paucity, oppressively less likely to be right than a multitude opposed to them. Introduction to the the Westcott Hort Greek New Testament, 1881, page 45. It must be noted that none of the codices, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Alexandrinus, agree with each other on the rendering of this verse either. So what is the supporting evidence for the inclusion of this verse? Well, as already seen, Roland Bington alluded to that having been aware of the inclusion of the words in the Latin Vulgate, and therefore it was very likely that Jerome had seen the words in the Greek manuscript from which he translated the Latin. Erasmus was very familiar with the Vulgate and so would have known that Jerome included it based on his Greek manuscripts at the time of his translation. Now, Jerome stated that he used uh, ancient Greek manuscripts during his translation. Now, that's ancient in 384 AD, so they must have been very early indeed. Jerome translated the Vulgate from the Greek into Latin, including the words over 1,100 years before Erasmus would include them in his works. And you can see here in the Latin. Furthermore, the very first complete English Bible made by Wycliffe in 1380 included the words in full, 86 years before Erasmus was even born. And we can see John Wycliffe's version here and the original words as well. Just a few of the people from church history that uh, have attested to the authenticity of this verse. Long before Jerome are Cyprian in 250 AD, Athanasius in 350 AD, Priscillian in 385 AD, uh, and Varimedium in 380 AD. Now the Cyprian's quotation is uh, really important as it comes from around 250 AD. The Lord says, I and the Father are one, and likewise it is written of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now this quotation comes long before any manuscript evidence that we have available to us today. Cyprian quoted from both John 10.30 and John, uh, 1 John 5.7. Now it is only in John 1, 5, uh, 1 John 5.7 that we find the words, and these three are one. Now he also clearly uses scriptum est, which is, it is written. So Cyprian clearly believed that it was written in 1 John 5, 7, that these three are one, which is only found in the longer version of 1 John 5, 7. We also have Priscillian, uh, as John says, there are three that give testimony in earth, the water, the flesh, and the blood, and these three are one, and there are three that give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one in Christ. But also, we have more evidence from people such as uh, Fulgentius in the 5th century, 
Cassiodorus in 580, Thomas Aquinas, Stephanus, John Calvin, Theodore Beza, John Owen, and John Wesley, to name just a few more. It is evident that there were Greek manuscripts available during the time of John Calvin that are no longer available to us today. John Calvin himself stated, There are three that bear record in heaven. The whole of this verse has been by some omitted. Jerome thinks that this has happened through design rather than through mistake, and that indeed only on the part of the Latins. But as even the Greek copies do not agree, I dare not assert anything on the subject. Since, however, the passage flows better when the, this clause is added, and as I see that it is found in the best and most approved copies, I am inclined to receive it as the true reading. So John Calvin stated that in the best uh, and most approved copies of his time, uh, this verse was found in the same reading as it is in the KJV, and he understood it to be scripture. Robert Stephanus, in his third edition of the Greek New Testament, in the margin, stated that seven of the 15 or 16 manuscripts that he had in his possession contained the jo uh, Johannian comma. The printed New Testaments of the Greek Orthodox Church contain the words. The Greek Orthodox Church would not have based the inclusion of the words on anything other than the inclusion of the words in the Greek manuscripts. Being that they were the keepers of the Greek, they just would not have based the inclusion on the fact that these words were found in the Latin. Although not contained in the majority of Greek manuscripts that we have available today, we do have earlier manuscript attestation than before the available manuscripts that include the words. The words are found in the margin in manuscripts 221 in 10th century, 635 in the 11th century, and 88 in the 12th century. They are also found in early Latin manuscripts, R from the 5th century, and Q, which dates to about the 5th or uh, and 7th century. It is also included in I, again from the 5th century. Now, we literally have hundreds of Latin manuscripts that contain the longer reading. Jerome stated that, uh, as John Calvin uh, had uh, attested to about Jerome, Jerome stated that there were scribes removing this section from the Greek manuscripts, omitting the words Father, Word, and Spirit. And I quote, Just as these are properly understood, and so translated faithfully by interpreters into Latin, without leaving ambiguity for the readers, nor allowing the variety of genres to conflict, especially in the text where we read the unity of the Trinity is placed in the first letter of John, where much error has occurred at the hands of unfaithful translators, contrary to the truth of faith, who have kept just the three words, water, blood, and spirit, in this edition, omitting mention of Father, Word, and Spirit, in which, especially, the Catholic faith is, is, uh, is strengthened and the unity of substance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is attested. The prologue to the canon, uh, canonical epistles of Jerome. Although Jerome attested to the verses witness to the Catholic faith, we can clearly see that Jerome believed the wording of the verse to have been uh, not being added, but being removed by intention and not through mistake from scripture. This is clear evidence that the wording of the verse was not only known, but also considered scripture long before any current surviving manuscript that we have attesting to the wording. Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate from the Greek. Clearly, by his inclusion of the verse, the verse was in the Greek manuscripts that he used at the time. 
Socrates of Constantinople, a fifth century church historian, also claimed that 1 John uh, was being corrupted for theological reasons. Now, in any event, he did not perceive that in the Catholic epistle of John, it was written in the ancient copies, every spirit that severs Jesus is not from God. For the removal of this passage out of the ancient copies are understandably by those who wish to sever the divinity from the human economy. And thus, by the very language of the ancient interpreters, some have corrupted this epistle, aiming at severing the humanity from the divinity. But the humanity is united to the divinity and are not two, but one. Knowing this, the ancients did not hesitate to call Mary Theotokos. There is also very clear evidence that not just this verse, but the section of 1 John had been tampered with 1 John 5, 6 shows uh, major variants between the very manuscripts that are used to prove the shorter reading of 1 John 5, 7 and show that the longer reading is not authoritative. In 1 John 5, 6, Vaticanus reads that Jesus came by water and blood. Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus both read that Jesus came by water, blood, and the Spirit. 0296 has the Spirit before the blood. Now the NIV, ESV, and NASB, and other modern versions are all silent regarding these variants at this point. To ignore these clear differences between these manuscripts in this verse, while using the, these manuscripts to disprove 1 John 5, 7, is simply dishonest. Now, there may be evidence for the deliberate omission of the words, uh, and Erasmus, in a writing entitled Ecclesiastical Theology, uh, 3, 4, 6, which is a writing against Marcellus of uh, An An Ancyra, makes a claim that the, the statement that the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, is also Sibelian. And thus, once again, the statement that the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one, is also Sibelian. Marcellus also expressed this same opinion and somewhere wrote, for it is impossible for three existing hypostases to be united in a monad unless earlier the triad should have its beginning from a monad. For St. Paul said that those things which in no way belong to the unity in God will be brought together in a monad, for only the word and the spirit belong to the unity of God. Now, while Eusebius does not specifically quote the comma here, the wording Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one is indeed found only within the comma, so it must be at least uh, is a possibility that he was attesting to the comma. So it would seem that it was believed at the time of Erasmus anyway, that the comma was deemed and being used by the Sabellians as proof of their doctrine. So along with the attestation that the passage was being removed for theological reasons, it is at least plausible to conjecture that the passage was being removed as a counter to its usage by Sabellianism. Another major uh, piece of evidence is the Confession of Faith of the Council of Carthage in the year 484, which makes attestation to the words in John. And I shall put the um, Confession of Faith here, and you can clearly see there are three who bear witness in heaven, 
the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. There are Syriac versions also that contain the comma. And Tremelius translated the comma from the Greek into the Syriac and placed it into the margin. However, he did also leave a blank space where the verse would fit. This is at least, um, it gives rise to Tremelius having doubts regarding the non-authority uh, of this verse. Uh, also, uh, Gutbier's uh, lexicons, uh, Syriusum, uh, contains the comma also. Now, it is very possible that there were manuscripts of the Syriac that did agree with the TR and the KJV. The Syriac actually gives a hint that the comma was, in fact, part of the text in 1 John 5, 8, the Syriac reads, and there are. The wording only appears in Bibles where the comma is present. The Syriac was copied from the Greek manuscripts that, while not containing the wording, as in the KJV, it clearly had the remnants of the introduction to verse 8 that appears only in those Bibles that contain the comma based on there being the clause in the preceding verse. Now, I'm also going to give a possibility for how the longer reading was lost that is not based on deliberate omission, but one of accidental oversight. Let's have a look at the verse uh, 7 and 8 together as it appears in the TR. Notice that the starts of each verse are identical except for the hoti. At the beginning of verse 7 and the kai at the start of verse 8. Now if a copyist's eye went from martyrantes of verse 7 to the martyrantes of verse 8, we would end up with a text that looks rather like this, which is almost identical to the text of the UBS Nestle Allen text. So whether you accept the words as they are in the KGV is ultimately down to your own personal understanding and conviction. However, it is very likely uh, or it is very unlikely, I should say, that the commonly portrayed by those that argue against the KJV, uh, either through lack of study or through being disingenuous with the truth, that there is actually plenty of evidence and indeed favorable evidence is supporting the inclusion of these words. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, and I look forward to seeing you on my next video.